Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Adventure. Uh, thanks for having me today. It's a real honor to be speaking here at uh, TEDx Jersey City. Today, we're going to be talking about contemporary superhumanity. I want to start off by asking you guys a question, which is who here used a superpower before they came in today? You did. Did you access an infinite pool of information with the wave of a finger? You did. Find out it's growing. It's growing. So that serves as an example. All of you probably today at some point maybe communicated with someone many miles away, maybe even on the other side of the world, instantaneously. And you might not have even thought that it was anything special because it's ubiquitous at this point. Now, for the purpose of this talk, we have to ask ourselves a couple more important questions. What is a superhuman and what constitutes a superhuman ability? The average human can run about six miles an hour for several miles, has five senses with certain ranges, binocular vision, opposable thumbs, and a high-powered brain. Now, the ability to hone the body through training to levels that might seem like they're superhuman is, for the sake of this lecture, still considered a, a human ability. Um, we improve with use, we get smarter when we study, stronger when we lift weights, um, more resilient and with proper conditioning. Uh, this is normal. You know, people who are kung fu masters and virtuoso pianists, you might say, oh, I could never do that. You probably could. You just need to practice every day. Um, so a superhuman ability then um, allows a person to perceive, conceive, and act in ways that surpass what a lifetime of training would be able to accomplish. By this definition, though, there are two superhuman abilities that every human possesses, the ability to communicate and the ability to make tools. Uh, communication allows us to pass along knowledge that's been compiled for centuries uh, without having to spend our whole lives researching it. Um, and we have access to more techniques now for personal improvement than at any point in human history. And we can access all of this information instantaneously and from almost anywhere. Um, and tools allow us to measure things beyond the range of our senses, process information in ways that our brains can't, um, and do things the human body is incapable of doing, make things that have never existed before and go further, faster, and higher than we would be able to with just the powers of our bodies alone. And uh, we're living in a post-superhuman world, but because our abilities are external to our bodies, we generally don't consider them as a part of us, but this is changing quickly. Um, brain interfaces for controlling prosthetic devices and um, uh, uh, robotic limbs, uh, they've been around for years. Um, augmented reality systems have been hitting the markets. Uh, screens are being made into contact lenses as we speak. Imagine just a few your, short years from now uh, that you could have access to all the capabilities of a cutting edge communications device in a small implant, implanted under your skin, interfaced with a contact lens, with a little implanted microphone in your jawbone. And then all of a sudden, you can have access to all of this information and these co communication tools without an external apparatus. It's part of you. So a person, you could instantly download an encyclopedia directly into your brain, perhaps. Um, you could analyze data in real time in a way that you know, even a lifetime of studying physics wouldn't allow you to do. Uh, telepathy would be about as commonplace as texting. And we could share our experiences, sensations, and emotions with each other as they happen. How much more quickly could we advance technologically and grow culturally with the ability, the ability to communicate so fully with the rest of humanity? My interest in biotechnology began when I was about nine years old. Um, my grandfather had Parkinson's disease. And I remember going up to my mother one day and I said, classic engineer's question, what's the problem? What's wrong with him? And she said, well, his nerves and his muscles don't communicate. And I said, well, he needs new nerves and new muscles. And I trotted right off and I started reading anatomy books and uh, I started designing a suit, which was an artificial muscle suit with a neural interface. Um, I found out later that this might not necessarily be the best uh, way of treating uh, Parkinson's disease, but it did have a lot of potential for treating other neuromuscular disorders. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, nervous system disorders. Now, uh, since that time, I've been studying uh, biotechnology independently as well as attending school for biomedical engineering and biology. Uh, and during this time, I had the opportunity to work 
uh, in a prosthetics lab learning how to fabricate um, uh, prosthetic devices and using the, the tools and techniques of the, tr of the trade. Custom prosthetics designs um, ha are paving the way for new approaches for replacing lost or damaged limbs. Uh, someday making it possible to exceed the capabilities of the original limb. Now, research has been taking place for the last few decades into making uh, highly dexterous robotic limbs for, prost uh, for prosthetic devices uh, using a variety of inputs and controls from the body. Now, these technologies are slowly wading into the waters of having fully body integrated uh, prosthetic devices. Uh, the goal for most of these technologies is to have, technology, uh, to have prosthetics that look, um, function, and feel to the user like they're a natural extension of the body. Uh, however, there is far more promise that these technologies hold for unlocking the potential of human expression and capability. And so in 2007, I founded the New Flesh Workshop in my mom's garage. Um, yeah, that's where it starts. Um, with the intent to make aesthetically and functionally customized prosthetics, orthotics, and other medical devices. Um, I realized that the materials being used for conventional, uh, for conventional prosthetics uh, would allow for a wide range of modifications, such as adding peripheral technologies, um, increasing the durability of a device, or altering the aesthetics to the wearer's preference. And uh, although when I started, there were no other companies offering prosthetics customizations as an aftermarket um, option, now there are several. Um, and with this, as well as because of advances in 3D design and uh, 3D printing, um, uh, consumers, users of prosthetic devices and other medical devices are now becoming much more aware that they have these options um, and they're taking a much more active role in influencing the design and the functionality of their prosthetics, which is very important. Um, as the field develops in the coming decades, we're going to see devices that are not only external expressions um, of ourselves, but also biologically integrated devices that are truly a part of us. Now, what this means is that someday we'll be able to upgrade uh, our, and redesign our bodies from scratch. Um, not only replacing lost limbs, but also um, enhancing and augmenting existing ones. Now, uh, so these are some examples of prosthetics I've made over the last year. Uh, this is a finger that belongs to uh, an artist and fabricator named Brian Chirac. And uh, his, his hand was crushed by a pallet of wood. So I, I had met him doing uh, some, some work and uh, I saw that he didn't use what was left of his pinky. I said, well, if I give you like a nifty little finger with something on it that you can use, will you start rehabbing your pinky? He's like, yeah, sure. And so, so I made him this, which is, uh, it's got interchangeable screwdriver heads to use it to build um, like display boxes for, for museums and such. That's his, uh, his thing. Um, this, is, uh, this is a finger I made for a, um, a DJ musician and sound technician named Compton Timberwolf. And uh, he lost his, uh, his ring fingertip in elevator door when he was very young and uh, has since had to compensate when he plays the piano. So I made him a fingertip he could use to play the piano. It's based off of a below the knee sports prosthetic, but I just made it real little. Um, and I added in a, uh, a flashlight so that he can see what he's doing when he's DJing. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, this is uh, Eduardo Garcia. Now, Eduardo has a very interesting story. Um, he is a, um, uh, a high-end private chef and uh, an outdoorsman, and he lives out in Montana. One day, he was out hiking, and while he's out hiking, he sees this little bear skull. And he's like, wow, cool little bear skull. And he goes to poke it with his knife and gets electrocuted very badly. Um, turns out the, the bear had long before died because there was an exposed... Um, high power wire buried there improperly. And um, so he lost his hand due to burns, he lost a chunk of his skull, uh, he lost a chunk of his ribs. Uh, however, um, this barely slowed him down. He walked out of the woods to the hospital himself. Uh, and then after several months of recovery, he had his new arm and he was back to work. Uh, I met him and I asked him, like, do you need anything from me? Like, what can I do to help hot rod your stuff? He's like, I got a design team at the local college that already made me a quick release so I can go bow hunting. And he has this little thing he hits with his tongue so he can use his prosthetic while he goes bow hunting. And I'm like, well, what do you need from me? He's like, well, I really want to go snowboarding, but I don't have my titanium ribs in yet, and I have a hole this big over my heart. Can you make me something? I said, sure. Yeah, so I made him this. It was a carbon fiber 
polycarbonate uh, neoprene uh, rib guard. And uh, I talked to him a few months later. I said, hey, you know, how's everything going? He's like, oh, it works great. I'm like, how do you know it works great? He said, well, it took like a 200-foot tumble ragdoll down a mountain, and I'm fine. So it works. Um, this, uh, this is one of my new pieces. Uh, this is a conventional um, below-the-knee prosthetic that uh, I uh, upgraded uh, with a bulletproof case mod. So this piece, um, uh, next week I actually get to take down to a shooting range and test. So that's very fun. Let me see how that turns out. Uh, this is some of our armor. Now, armor is really interesting because early on at New Flesh, I realized that the same lightweight, robust, and versatile materials used in prosthetics could also be used to make body armor systems. Uh, now, high-impact composite materials embedded with technology and form the molds of the body uh, all by hand using the same techniques that have been around for fabricating prosthetics for centuries, as well as several techniques and tools that I had to bootstrap myself from other processes. Um, the result is a lightweight, flexible, form-fit, ballistic and stab-resistant body armor system that can be upgraded with various forms of technology and customized to the wearer's style. For the people on the edge of human capability, the ones pushing their bodies and minds to the limit, there need to be protective technologies that can withstand the forces of a space dive, pressures at the ocean floor, or flying off a jet-powered motorcycle at 163 miles an hour, which is the current land speed record for a jet-powered motorcycle ride. So, um, after, you know, uh, in the next few years, um, uh, techniques for fabricating composite materials uh, are, are going to get blown wide open because there's some new technologies on the market that are really, really game changers. For example, uh, graphene, uh, an incredibly strong, easily, easily uh, made super material, um, and uh, genetically engineered spider silk that's, you know, 100 times stronger than seal. Uh, you could be, basically make a bulletproof uh, shirt about as thin as this piece of paper or make a, a steel beam that you could lift yourself that would hold up this roof. Um, it's incredible. So, anyways, um, after, um, after years of undergoing the patent process, I received my first patent for an electromagnet-based telescoping artificial muscle system in 2011. It's the same one I've been working on since I was nine years old. And uh, it's a simple electromagnetic device, um, and it's intended as an implant to replace muscle lost or damage due to uh, illness or injury or other uh, nerve damage. Um, by using an electromagnet in combination with permanent magnets, uh, much like a solenoid, the device generates contractile force from electrical energy. And it can be made in arrangements that allow for direct control signals from the body. They don't have to be converted into digital control signals after you get them out of the body, um, which cuts down on the amount of, uh, of computing and computers that you have to use with them. Um, it, um, now, even though it's designed for implantation, it can also be used externally for robotics, uh, prosthetics, and, uh, and orthotics, um, ideally providing very natural kind of motion and intuitive um, control and feedback. Now, although there's many technologies on the market for artificial muscles that are being experimented with, uh, primarily um, contractile polymers, uh, there are still several hurdles. For example, they're not biocompatible generally. Um, they're very ex expensive and they, they require pretty complicated control systems. Um, and although my muscle is still in the prototyping stages, uh, someday it could potentially help millions of people affected by um, nerve damage, neuromuscular disorders, and muscle trauma. So, back to superpowers. Um, there's currently several, there are currently several companies around the world developing powered exoskeletal systems uh, for strength and endurance augmentation. And uh, although many of these are designed with military applications in mind, there are several um, that are being developed as alternatives to wheelchairs that would allow people paralyzed from the waist down to walk on two legs unaided. Um, that means we're, and these guys just a week ago had their first uh, 5K with about a half dozen people paralyzed from the waist down. So yeah, that's incredible. It's an incredible thing. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a remarkable thing. Now, even though these technologies are just starting to be developed, 
there's already people starting to try to like figure out the other ways of doing them ourselves. Now, the interesting thing then becomes 3D printing uh, and home uh, microcontroller design and all of these new technologies that we have so that a person in their own garage can develop these technologies. So what happens when a person, you know, can have his neighbor's kid come around and collect his old milk jugs and use it to make an exoskeleton that he goes jumping around the neighborhood with? Or more importantly, a small lab in a third world country can print advanced prosthetics very cheaply from locally available recycled materials and um, um, from a secondhand 3D printer. So, um, so 3D printing I talked about. Bioprinting is the ability to not only print living tissues, um, but also potentially entire organs. Now, not only can you print entire organs with this technology when it's in its, its mature state, you'd be able to integrate uh, other technological components directly into these artificial organs and tissues, basically breaking wide open um, this, this um, you know, ability to completely redesign ourselves from scratch. Um, so, in a world where you can access limitless information, communicate instantly with any person, process data like a supercomputer, make any object you can imagine, Augment your body and mind as you see fit, including replacing parts that you've lost. What will you be able to accomplish in this superhuman future? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.